Before cabin fever gripped Anna, Craig and Darren, there was a time when they were just unknown hopefuls. Why I applied? Uh, mainly because uh, obviously I want to be on TV. I want to become uh, Britain's most hated and loved guy, <laughs> as we all do. And if one of the challenges are to break the chicken's head and cook it. <laughs> That's enough for that. Let's go to the pub. I'm going, Andy. I'm going to have a cantonese. Yes. What made you apply? I saw the programme on uh, the Dutch Big Brother. Mm. I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was mad. I thought it was perverse. This summer, the usual slew of boring repeats and uncompelling programming was replaced by a revolutionary new game show. Two, coming to four on four. Thank you, five. Darren's on five. Coming to two on two. A crew of 150 had worked round the clock to keep Big Brother's heart beating. I need Thomas on the camera. I haven't got him. Thomas. Thomas, three. Thomas in the toilet. He's in the toilet. Nine weeks of live internet coverage and 9,000 hours of videotape recorded on 26 cameras and 55 microphones made these faces the most famous in Britain. Cut it. There it is. Coming to three. Tonight, on we three. go inside Big Brother to reveal the machine behind the madness. Well, someone else on three. Coming to five. Thank you. This game show's rubbish. It's a stupid <laughs> idea that somebody stupid. came up with. Sort of stupid Who was it? Was it anyway. Stupid Dutch. Typical. <laughs> After the kickoff in Holland exactly a year ago, uh, Big Brother turned out to be a huge success. But then the big question is, is it purely Dutch or is it going to work uh, all over the place? And that's horrible, starting out with something that's huge everywhere else and you think, oh, well, what if it's not the same in England? Hey, Godverdomme! <laughs> The Dutch Big Brother had had a relaxed feel to it. Its winner, Bart, affected a laid-back bad boy demeanor and had no qualms getting it on in front of millions. It ran for 100 days. Every two weeks, a contestant was evicted live on primetime TV to huge audiences. What actually went out in those countries, I, as a producer, looked at and thought, it, it won't work in England. It was very slow, and so we changed the format. Fundamentally, we put it in a late-night slot instead of prime time, and we also have um, an eviction every week, which means that it's harsher, shorter, sharper. I think everyone expected it to do well as a programme, but the question was how will it do well, you know, if it's going to be on late at night on Channel 4? Is it really going to have the same mass appeal that it's had in some other countries? The key thing was to cast it, I suppose. Um, so that it wouldn't be boring. I just don't know what I'm after. In January, Channel 4 launched a nationwide search for prospective Big Brother contestants. It was just a mountain of paper. The phones were ringing constantly. I just don't oh know my God. what I'm after. They had just three months to find ten suitable contestants out of an initial 45,000 hopefuls. We weren't going to look for obvious types, a mother figure, a leader, or obvious people that would be irritating, and yes, they are all under 40. But that's because of the viewers at that time and your target audience. There were a lot of sort of young people who wanted to get into television. We deliberately were trying to filter out people that we thought were literally only going in just because they wanted to be famous. We worked on the theory that if you put a Nazi in with a black man, they're sort of not going to get on, and there would be a drama, there would be a row, and that would be it. She's written at the bottom of it, yes, I am fit. <laughs> <laughs> the Big Brother team mailed out 45,000 applications. 23,000 got filled out and returned. She comes over as being pretty together. People were required to send a photo and preferably a video. She's nice, but there's nothing about the form that grabs you either. Just... The production team then mercilessly cut the list down to a mere 300. And then they set off armed with cameras on a nationwide hunt for contestants. One day tears, one day 
By April, Britain's largest cities held host to the Big Brother auditions. The hopefuls were briefed on the house's strict rules, played a few team games, and then endured a rigorous interview. And of course, it was all on camera. I won't just put up with shit. Ooh. I gave them a minute on tape, basically, and if they hadn't sort of made me sit up, they went by the by. Could I go to the toilet? Would you mind? It's like even now I've been thinking about changing my job to do like an outside landscape gardening thing. Relationships can be tricky, can't they, you know? Yeah. Why landscape gardening? Don't know. I don't even know what it is, to be honest. But <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds good. <laughs> yeah, I might be a bit of an entertainer. Britain's very famous for being eccentric, and we did meet some fantastically eccentric people. And if I ever work for another programme and they're looking for a one-legged black lesbian in yeah. Manchester, I'm sure I can find one from the selection process of Big Brother. You're looking at my bruise? Yeah, what is that? <laughs> like? How did you do that? It's a carpet bed. Got thrown off a bed. My mood just depends on the day, do you know what I mean? I, I have got kind of about 12 different personalities, do you know what I mean? The most bizarre characters didn't really have particularly bizarre stories. They were just extraordinary people, fascinating, but probably wouldn't have worked within such a close, tight team environment. I'm very interested in psychology. I like to open people up under the right circumstances. Some of them fell by the wayside because they didn't pass medicals or psych checks or police checks. But we were left with about 20, all of whom we liked. Then the next stage was to pick a group of 10. I just don't know what I'm after. What makes the UK version uh, in my opinion, extremely good is that the people in the house are, are wonderful characters. The casting is really very, very good. I go on about um, spirits and uh, wands, magic wands and furries. <laughs> furries? What are furries? Furries! Do you think you can win it? Yeah. What is it about you that you think that you would keep you in for? <laughs> I don't know, just see what I do next. <laughs> <laughs> Right, ready, go. Hold on, hold on. Uh, I think if I was voted at first, I'd be like, yeah, I think I'd definitely be a bit, be a bit upset, but that's ego. Well, you have to, you have to go through the objective. Is there an elimination to find out who plays first? Uh, it's, it depends. It's just the prospective candidates were thoroughly briefed on the Spartan conditions that would prevail once inside the Big Brother house. This was not for the faint-hearted. You know you've got to live in this house, you don't have any luxuries, you don't have nothing you want or you ever have on everyday life, yeah. you're constantly filmed, and I need so many stuff, and to be stripped of it, yeah. and to need to survive, would be a sort of, ah, can I do this? I just want to do that, I want to yeah. do it, because I want to be stripped of what I think I need to take me through the day. Yeah. They all knew what they are getting themselves in for, but we were very clear with, you know, how we'd make the programme and what we'd do. I'm very decisive. Um, I work very, very quickly as well. I'm very multitasking. I'm very, I've got a lot of nervous energy. Obviously, I think that was a wider um, concern also. of a lot of the people who took part is, how am I going to look? And the, one of the hardest things for them to take on board is they're just not going to know, and they kind of have to trust us on that. So you're not going to be watching we, us taking a dump then? No. <laughs> we could give a sort of unequivocal guarantee that if anyone was going to the toilet, we wouldn't show it. Good, because yeah. I've got no tits, and I don't like me arse. Well, yeah. <laughs> that would be a sort of an infringement, I think, of your privacy. Now, I don't mind living with strange people. It'll just be, there's going to be, I'm, I'm sure, a little edge to people who are going to be performing. It's not ten weeks with, and that's it. It's ten weeks and there's a winner. I think there's one thing usually wins me over with people so whenever I walk into a room with a big grin on me. Right. You know, people can't adjust that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's the first impression, really. They had charisma, I suppose. When they walked into the room, they made me sit up and listen to them. Eh. I'm Nicholas Bateman. I'm 32 uh, years old. Sometimes if people don't actually like you, they're not necessarily going to listen to what you've got to say. Only they'll listen, but it won't go in. Yeah. So you talk to the rest of the group and try and get them convinced, you know, by somebody else. People who come onto this programme, if they did have anything to hide, they're just going to be fucked, basically. I think, like all things, you have to be grown up. And there's no point uh, in burning bridges. And I think with any human uh, relationship, you have to be nice to the other person, otherwise I just, I, I, just, I just believe in what comes around goes around. I do think most of the people who went in there went in just for the life experience. I just thought, well, they're interesting, they're charismatic. Let's see what happens. If the task of finding ten appropriate contestants had been a shot in the dark, then the challenge of meeting the daunting technical requirements was even more of a risk. 
the creation of a show that was to go out seven times a week on TV and 24 hours live on the internet was to be a first in British broadcast history. It was more tense and more sort of before we went on air, just because of the pressure of actually getting the big massive machine up and running. We come storming in and we decide that not only we're going to make the internet do something it's not intended to do, we're going to stream six separate feeds of video 24 hours a day. We had to set up an infrastructure that was absolutely unprecedented in terms of the scale of it in this country. To try and turn around a half hour documentary in 24 hours had never really been done before. We'd, we'd put all these systems in place and written up this was how it's going to work, but we didn't actually know if it would work. Bow, East London. This dreary plot of wasteland was to be transformed into a virtual space station. They wanted it to look good at the same time as be slightly deprivational, I suppose. Production designer Colin Piggott's brief was to create a film set that masqueraded as a trendy prison, while also being a 24-hour goldfish bowl. We called it Penal Chic. So it was a penal place, an institution, but the things that were dressing it could be sort of slightly desirable. Maybe. That desirability was enhanced with donations of sofas from Habitat and kitchen units from Ikea. We got the kitchen units, which weren't in their catalogue, so in fact they'd been on television two months before they came out in their own catalogue, so they were delighted. But the interesting thing was that it is a house that's made for people to live in, but it's a temporary film set. The thing was to approach it with a sense of humour, I suppose. While the house's interior gave off a penal vibe, the garden, on the other hand, contained chickens and organic vegetables designed to ease the future housemates into a back-to-basics lifestyle. We desperately wanted to give them a pet, and I, for ages, argued with Ruth that I wanted to give them a goat. And I said, I know they're terribly destructive, but I love goats, because they're funny, because they always look like devils, and they are just very destructive. And we thought they could milk it as well, but there was a big divide on the production team to goat or not to goat. <laughs> There were 19 specially designed remote cameras in the house and the garden. Integrated into the interior was the camera run, where one-way mirrors hid five permanently manned cameras. Except in emergencies, this would be as close as any human would get to the residents. A week before going live, six volunteers lived in the house for three days. Once the show was up and running, there'd be no opportunity to fix mistakes. All the producers and directors were paranoid that people would hide. So we've cut lots of camera holes in the back of the lockers and under the beds. And there's a, all around the bottom of the garden in the chicken run. Some 200 metres away from the house was the gallery, Big Brother's central nervous system. From here, producers would maintain control over the house and choose which cameras would provide what footage for the internet and TV broadcasts. Most of the time, I'm looking after the gallery, um, watching through what goes on the logging stuff, and being in charge of communicating things by the voice of God, as we call it, to the people in the house. I've worked on lots of really interesting shows in my time, but this one, just for the scale of it, probably takes the biscuit. You know, it's a production team of well over 100 people. It's like moving house or building your own house. It's like, will it work? Will it be on time? Technically, it, it was clunking along at one point. It was like the cameras don't work and this doesn't work. And those things you can't control, you have to do it and find out that it doesn't work. In the end, you're powerless because this you just hand over and watch it violated. So I should have screwed everything down. But at the moment, only the sofas are screwed down, the dining room table. Cut it. There it is. Coming to three. On three. To As Big Brother anxiously tested its systems, it was becoming increasingly clear that the only true test would be to do it for real, live, on air. Thank you all. In a bid to shield the ten contestants from the press, they were given just a week's notice to prepare for their date with TV history. Their new house with its Fort Knox-like security system was just about ready. And the voice of God from the gallery, as embodied by Big Brother, was the sole contact they would have with the outside world. Even then, Big Brother could only listen and reveal nothing. Big Brother would like to remind you that there are cameras everywhere 
and you cannot hide things from Big Brother. It was time to go live. It has always been a disaster waiting to happen. We were still in there ten minutes before they were due. It was strange. I think Neil had a tear, didn't you, Neil? Did you cry from that? You sort of spent yeah. so many He did feel weeks, a bit funny. However many hours a day on it or thinking about it, and suddenly, in the space of ten minutes, you were out. Two minutes before the Mercedes drove into the car park, we didn't have all the video streams physically up and running and tested and, and stable. So it was absolute chaos. I just wanted to ensure that they were safe, that they knew people were watching them all the time. They were our lives, they were our jobs. And so seeing them go in, it was like, oh, bye. What was weird was when I went over and thought, my God, we really have shut 10 people in a house. Brilliant. You stop staring at me. <laughs> when I first saw them arrive, I thought they were the worst group ever. They were hyped up, acting to camera. <laughs> I went, ah, God, who are these horrible people in there? I didn't think they had a brain cell between them. God! <laughs> They all took the clothes off and started pressing their bodies against the wall and then shaved each other's head. And it was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, what's happened? They've all gone mad. At that stage, I was thinking, these people are not normal. People in that situation could pretend to be somebody else for probably seven, eight days. And unfortunately, we had a, a terrible car accident in the Northern Territories, which uh, killed her. Oh, oh my Jesus. God. So, and then? the mask would fall off and the real personality would, would be shown. You've got this, a, little, a little kind of like, not, I wouldn't say nasty, that's too much of a, that's too kind of strong a word, but there's a little kind of side of you that you keep very well hidden. But then they settle down, and that's, that's the point of it. There's cameras everywhere, so they can only do that for a certain amount of time. Despite everyone being really horrible about the ten people in the house when they first moved in, saying they're shameless egotists and they're unbearable, all of them, people have grown to really like them. Once that hump was over and the system started to grind and sort of start churning out, it became a lot easier because it was very apparent that it did work. <laughs> That's Arthur. That's Arthur. <laughs> As the Big Brother housemates settled into their new roles and home, they took to the cameras like ducks to water. But you asked us some questions like, is Big Brother a good show? And yeah, up and down on this one. This one. No way. Is Nick a nice person? <laughs> At the same time, a large part of the British public was overcoming their voyeuristic unease and beginning to wonder who was wanking and who was shagging. But meanwhile, life for the Big Brother crew was taking a little longer to get accustomed to. That's it. Now this way, human. Hello. <sighs> it's just so strange that, um, that we're working so close to them. And that, yeah, they don't have any idea that we're here, really. And you're actually standing behind a mirror, and they can't see you, you can see them. I find a very strange and unsettling experience. But I do think this whole program is weird. <laughs> Hello. Don't go. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Big Brother had stipulated that no loo or shower shots were to be shown gratuitously to the audience, either via the internet or on television. But they were being filmed, just in case. And so the crew were more privy to the contestants' intimate moments than any viewer could ever hope for.
When someone's on the loo, you just can't watch. Even if you like think, oh, I fancy someone, it's really hard. There's kind of something within you that makes you really think that watching it is wrong. But you just become immune to it because it's not actually that interesting after you've had a look the first time. <laughs> front or back? <laughs> Definitely front. Oh, I think. The shower, uh, it's not quite so taboo, so it's not quite so bad, and sometimes it's quite fun to watch. But Nicholas was always the most amusing in the shower because he used to piss in the shower every time he had a shower. He used to stand there rocking uh, backwards and forwards while he pissed in the shower. Um, and not just in the actual shower pan, but often over onto the mat. The food you ordered is now in the store. Yeah! Would Big Brother like my teddy bear to go to bed with? A cosy relationship of codependence was forming between the house and Big Brother. She's about to discover the group's new weekly task. Oh, fuck it out, you guys. The relationship relied heavily on a mixture of tasks and treats given out by Big Brother. <sighs> <laughs> This alleviated boredom for the group and gave them the opportunity to bond. <laughs> what? <laughs> just Dave don't have a It fight. also gave Big Brother a way to shape events inside the house. This is a man who spent three or four years in the TAs. Do you think it's all lies? On a Monday, they do the nominations. Oh, Craig. 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 This is horrible. You're so cruel. On a Tuesday, we tell them the nominations. On a Wednesday, they complete their task. Unfortunately, you have failed to successfully complete this week's task. Why? 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 If they get something wrong, then they lose because of it. Thursday is the only day where there isn't anything specific. There's already a lot of structures built in from the show, and the whole idea of the show really is just to show them doing exactly what they want to. Friday is the day that one of them's going to leave. Saturday, they order their shopping, get given a new task, and Sunday, they get their shopping. So it's a horrible, boring list, but it, as a producer, when you start with a blank page, you know that event's going to happen. There is a level of control that you have over stuff that happens. Um, uh, it's just that it's less in terms of manipulation and it's more in terms of thinking about where it might go from there and making sure you're ready if it does go there. There comes a point where you think, let them be themselves and let them deal with their time and their money and everything how they want to as much as possible. Have you got any objections if, as the weeks go by now, we don't need as many chickens or eggs? If we neck a chicken and have it for lunch? Big Brother will get back to you. And they run their own world. If they decided to kill all the chickens and have a big barbecue, I probably wouldn't stand in their way. I'm not necessarily sure. I'd, I'd have to check that they could do it humanely. Fuck off. It's not Big Mother, you know, it's Big Brother. They in the house determine what happens in the house, and we have very little to do with it other than being able to actually select the moments which will be very special. And yours are just like... Do you know what? I didn't have them. them. Pendulous. Pendulous. Yours are quite pendulous. No, them to have um, They're quite voluptuous. As the television producers selected the most titillating parts for the broadcast, they realised that the 24-hour live internet coverage could pose a potential threat. Everybody who's out of television is used and relies on being able to spoon-feed their audience. The huge difference here is that the television people are doing that in the face of an audience that's actually watching all their rushes. In theory, viewers were able to watch the house as closely as Big Brother, although a 30-second delay did exist to edit out strong language, and the diary room was never shown on the net because it was a place of refuge for the contestants. It was fair game for TV, however, and a source of much hilarity in the edit room. It's a nice geezer, Darren, isn't it? We want to grow an egg into a chick, and we don't know how to do it, but Tom's a farmer, and Tom's told us how to do it, and we just want to make sure we don't get animal writes onto us. He's yeah, but you know, he is stupid. Shall we put, like, the egg in the oven and make it hatch? And, you know, you can make, make it grow in the oven. He ain't bright. To satisfy the television audience, producers continuously logged every movement inside the house to help them compile the highlights from hours and hours of mundane footage. You're involved in something which is very different to anything else. You're, you're watching reality as opposed to in any way creating it. Because even in a documentary situation, you are following reality, but you've always got an eye to what you might like. 
that's why people watch it, because they get the sense that anything could happen, because anything could happen. The only way you can actually make it work and get great programmes is to sit back um, and listen to what they say and think, is what they're saying interesting? And if it is, well then, it's the actual basis of a good story. I've never had a day where I've gone, oh, God, you know, what are we going to put in tonight's show? There's nothing there. It's usually the opposite. Every day something happens and everybody goes, <gasps> and it's like this ripple goes, you know, from over there, which is the control room where everybody sees the monitors, and it kind of ripples through the whole production team, and then it ends up with, like, a phone call to me down at the other end. <laughs> As the weeks went by, the numbers in the house dwindled and it was becoming easier for the crew to follow the house's movements with fewer voices to listen to. And the show's ratings were soaring. The ratings, 4.6 million, 38 percent. Not only was the audience watching, but the crew was hooked as well. When I first watched it in the control room, you actually do sit there and you feel you could sit there all day. Well, I'd better go on with something else. I've just sat and wasted two hours of my life. The worst thing about working here is that everybody works here next to these monitors. It's only a game show, it's only a game show. It's pretty much impossible to get anything done without being drawn over to the monitors to see what's going on in the conversations. I mean, I'm not sure how, uh, how much kind of post-trauma therapy they're going to need to go into afterwards, but at the moment, everybody is just on a huge high. Can you fix it so that... Claire and Tom continue to flirt. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <I'm trying. laughs> Can we fix it? Do you think they're going to have sex? Yeah, I think, I think it's a definite sexual possibility. <laughs> Dad, I think you'll find get the get stories tell there. themselves of people doing people crazy. things. Do you think they're going to have sex? Listen, listen, um, it's Mel and Tom. She's been flirting with him all weekend and uh, then demanded a full body massage of him. Well, you went to the see tonight's show. Well, last week, I really, really liked Darren, and I thought it'd be really good if Darren wins. Big brother doesn't joke, Darren. But last week, the Nicholas scenario with Darren, he kind of blew it for me, really. I thought he was really unreasonable. <laughs> you see, Put your shoes up here. The problem with Darren is a bit... <laughs> it is fascinating to watch mm. people doing nothing. The addictive nature of the experience kept up the crew's adrenaline, which peaked on the most climactic evening of the week. The top-rated live Friday night eviction. And we said the only way we we're going out was to be evicted. And no, I'm evicted! <laughs> Ow. Shush. Brilliant. It's non-stop. It's completely unrelentless. With crowds to control, friends and family to keep in check, additional cameras and more crew to cope with the work, the day would build into a frenzy with all eyes on the next victim. The only way going out of here is to be evicted. That's what we came in for. <laughs> You're not to leave. He fucking looks like a gremlin, man, I tell you. Got 30 seconds to get down there. Hey, guys, we've got some of Thomas's family here. You go bang into a live show, and then you really get the sense that she's taking us all down there. There's a rush of excitement because obviously the crowd are there. Here in a second now. Will you please leave the Big Brother house? Will you please leave the Big Brother house? In a way, it's good because Nikki will now. Good. Yeah. She'll she'll walk. She should walk. She should. She should walk. Thank you very fucking much. Do you want more? Well, it's only a game show. <laughs> Master at the punchline, brilliant. I'm a very feely, touchy person anyway. But I think especially when they've come out of that kind of real cocoon, they probably need a bit of a cuddle and a bit of a nudge on and a bit of a, you know, you're all right, don't worry. You see people going and you, you feel the sadness and you see the tears. After the Friday night ritual sacrifice, a feeling of melancholy settled on the house. We miss Kagi, eh? The crew empathised with their feelings. This show is, it's nasty. It's a nasty television programme, it's a nasty concept, and it's putting people in a real pressure cooker. I think I've got post-eviction blues. <sighs> yes, it's other people's misfortune on your telly, you know. The one time that's been very painful and difficult in the gallery was when Caroline was very upset. For all of us, as a kind of 
emotional and moral position. It was very hard to be in the gallery watching that happen um, because you felt in some way responsible for her uh, grief and misery and at the same time the dictates of the programme where you were trying to cover it in the best way you could and that was very awkward and very hard. It does sort of infect your consciousness a bit. It's so all-consuming because rather than just structuring a normal programme you're so involved intimately with their lives and governing their lives um, that this kind of responsibility of that starts to really get into you. No matter how involved they felt, Big Brother's biggest responsibility was to maintain an icy objectivity. I'm feeling like I want to go home. When you're actually in the diary room talking to them one to one, you are at the very crux of the kind of relationship between Big Brother and them. And if you do it badly, then you can make an entire mess of the whole production. The guidelines are that they never get, really never get into discussions with people, they listen. They're there to listen and to get back to them. We're always quite um, strict, but never un unfair or mean for the sake of it, because it would shift the whole power dynamic in a really bad way. And suddenly they'd realise actually they have the power, because they do, not us. And that's why every interaction you have when you're big brother, you're always kind of firm but fair, because it's like being a parent and they're the kids. What crisps are they, Melanie? Um, he was expecting some crisps as a reward for cleaning the windows. All and food must be brought out of your shopping budget, Melanie. <laughs> and the red wine? All drinks must be brought out of your shopping budget, Melanie. Oh. Oh, OK. But the kids often tested Big Brother's parental patience. Halfway in the double line. Oh, please stay in the garden. <laughs> oh, shit! Shit! Oh, shit! Oh, shit. <laughs> oh my God! Fuck. Fuck. When we were in there within 30 to 40 seconds. Get out, get out, get right, out, get out. Come on, out, 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 uh, but it's all dealt with in a proper professional manner, you see, so, yeah. yeah. Being. I know. <laughs> She's a human being. Hello. Yeah, yeah they're actually done? human beings, real human beings, they say, and that's all good to hear. Thanks, Thanks a million. Thanks. We'll Save like our <laughs> lives. Their safety does get to you. You're much more responsible, oddly, because you are responsible for the minutiae of their everyday lives, shouldn't you? Then there were the times Big Brother had to scramble to keep up with the action when Anna was confronting Nick about his uh, paedophilia stuff about uh, homosexuals, and, and she was absolutely furious. Ah, oh, oh, that's no. where you're so... No, no. no, come on. That is where that you're that taking it yeah. That's where that's I get ridiculous. really, really it angry. It took us quite a while to get the shot of her face while she was doing this. So the argument was generally from behind her on a wide shot or just not hands on hips. So you could feel the tension as a view. You could be so wanted to see her face and we didn't manage to get there in time. Because <laughs> when he says he propositions about? the kid, what's that? What do you mean if? It's got nothing to do with That is what I get so He's not angry. a paedophile. He's gay. He's gay. He's, gay. He's not a paedophile. They don't. It's not the same thing. It's not totally separate. No, that really makes me so angry. And they're actually terrifying moments while you're thinking, please don't stop having this amazing conversation about evictions or who might go or who you love or something else. Don't stop until the camera person gets there. But there were other, far more terrifying moments in store that would be captured by the cameras. To initiate strategic voting, we reserve the right to eject people from the house. Never mind the chip pan, the fireworks were just about to begin. Is there anything you'd like to say, Nicholas? Um, no, not at all. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's only a game show. 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 Apparently, it was only a game show. Nick, emigrate before you die. But no other game show promised the prospect of a public lynching of one of its contestants. I, I read a story in the Telegraph yesterday, I think, and the first two words of the story were Nasty Nick, and that was a phrase that I invented. To be sure, Nasty Nick was no picnic. Because I've got, like, design of wear, people would wonder how come I've got that, and I think I've dropped it in Do you think DC is a good combination, then? I've seen it all in my dream. Friday. Goodbye, Nicky. Can Nicholas please put on his microphone? I've seen everyone that's been the two, and I've got each right, uh, right each time. I think you're gonna stay. Big Brother is not pleased. Darren and Craig. Darren goes. 
Craig and Tom. Do you I, understand? I understand. Thank you. And you've got a wonderful life, and you're a very sensitive and supportive man, and I appreciate your care and uh, humility. He not only hoodwinked his housemates, he also amazingly managed to pull the wool over Big Brother's eyes. There were a few places where Nick was able to go, like in his locker, where he had some of these written things, and down in his case next to the bed at the floor, where somehow he'd managed to work out that our coverage wasn't very good. So we couldn't really see what was going on, and all he would do is go down, crouch down with someone for a sec, and be off again, um, and we wouldn't really have been able to tell what's going on. We didn't want to call him in to say, what were you doing? Because to confess that we couldn't see what he was doing was quite bad, because it would make it absolutely clear to him that he could do whatever he liked in these, these spots. So no, we never saw him write anything. The nation began tuning in in slack-jawed amazement to Nick's increasing audacity. On the internet, Big Brother Hollix maintained that Nick had a mobile phone. The mobile phone story originated from a phone call that I received anonymously, which sounded extremely credible. So I wrote, I wrote a discussion piece saying, is Nick in contact with the outside world? Big Brother even gave in to the mobile phone paranoia and raided the house. We're carrying out a security drill. Can everyone please go to the girls' bedroom where they must stay until further notice? Thank you. It's going to do whatever's necessary to keep himself here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, without question. I mean, that's that's not... I don't think that's anything to doubt. It'll backfire in the end, though. In the end, it was the housemates and not Big Brother that exposed Nick. When Tom decided to tell Craig about what Nick had been doing, there was just this look on Craig's face where all certainty in his world disappeared and this incredible thing where he'd finally learned to trust someone, which was Nick, and be a much more trusting person, and it had all gone completely wrong. Are you surprised that was why yeah. we had instigated to vote against me? Uh, I was, yeah. Was you? Goodbye. Uh, Nick. And just to see him sitting yeah. still in his bed, just staring at, at, towards the camera without knowing it, it was a fantastic moment. I feel like going out and knocking them out. <laughs> Just as things were reaching a climax, Big Brother disappeared. That was a mistake by the producer. He was worried momentarily that Craig might hit Nick. You could see the testosterone <laughs> pumping around, so he switched the net off. He didn't ask me, he didn't ask Connie, he didn't refer it up. Uh, and they forgot, <laughs> in the panic, to turn it back on. But despite the hiatus, what was bad news for Nick was good news for the online revolution that the show was promoting. Are you watching? Are you watching? They're about to confront Nick, apparently. Yeah. Undoubtedly, the point at which the internet really proved itself was when Nick was kicked out, because it happened pretty much spontaneously. I'm seriously shocked at the fact that you're showing people the names, Nick. Fucking sick. Nick, you're making me more of a two hours shot by saying you've only got two people's names on there. I think that's an absurd, Craig. It's not one of your. Oh, you liar. think it's absurd, Nick, but you've got a few flaps here. At first, you know, I looked up and tried to calculate, you know, is he, you know, is he right? You know, does he really know? No, but I didn't. Didn't. No, but. Where I just what I've been told, and I believe the people who have been here told me what I want to see for myself, my name on this piece of paper. That was the point where where our average viewers, our average um, number of users, probably potential. tripled, if not quadrupled, in on that one day. One more thing as well, Nick. I could see by the table that he did know, and so therefore, you know, well, I said, okay, fine, you're right. And that certainly will be looked at as definitely the biggest single event on the UK internet in the history of the internet. Yeah, I think everyone should be... Is this Big Brother watching us watching Big Brother? Uh, basically, I'm uh, sorry I have to say it, Nick, but I'm very disappointed in yourself. There was a bit which we showed um, of Thomas saying his last few words. I feel like I didn't you have to write down a Hopefully I'll see you on the outside, if I'm not being crucified. He helped Nick shut the case. It was so poignant, and that... I don't know whether it was PMT or something, but it really, somehow, it just struck a chord. I suddenly sort of thought, wow, Nick's leaving, you know. 
I gave him a really big hug. He was just in a state of shock. He'd, he'd been into the house, he'd explained to them, said he was sorry. It'd been like an emotional roller coaster, and he came out and he just needed a hug. You know, it was a bit upsetting to have to do it, didn't it? Because I thought, you know, I felt sorry for him, and it's a hard world he was going out into afterwards. Although Nick leaving left a kind of hole in the programme in some ways, I think it had to be done. The next morning at a press conference, Nick appeared to be right back on form. I, I would never, you know, run down any other contestant in the house. I mean, it's, it's obvious to me. <laughs> the much anticipated public lynching had turned into a public laughing. Uh, the publicity agent Max Clifford suggested today that you could now earn a million pounds either doing advertising or even being a pantomime villain. Well, if you give me his number, I might give him a call. Veered between being very frightened very scared man to being like, wow, you know, I can earn all this money and hey, isn't this cool? Made me think that he's not a Machiavellian genius. He's, he's, he's just a slightly misguided twit. Whatever you do is out of your control. You're just merely a puppet in the UK, the public lover villain. It's Nick Evil. The producer seeing this decided, you know, I'll be the villain of the house. As Nick resigned himself to his role as public panto enemy number one, the other evictees got their turn at the fame game. And holding their hands every step of the way was Keith, the celebrity handler. I'm here as, as, as support or aftercare, if you like, for the people when they come out of the house. <laughs> the first thing that happens is that the press want them. The press want the story. The Sun uh, have done an exclusive with me. Um, I had been offered the Sunday Sport, which I was going to do. They asked me to do topless, and I said no. Oh, OK, then. See you soon, then. I'll speak to you tomorrow, Keith. Bye. They have to do a general press call on the Saturday morning, uh, which all the press are invited to. You've been described uh, in some of the photos as the praying mantis. Because, you know, oh, here. Death on the <laughs> you have to spend time with a psychologist for a proper debrief so that they're not sort of let out into the open world. It's a bit like coming up from deep sea diving, you know, they get the bends coming up from that. No. Oh, sorry. Hello? 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 Oh, I need the earpiece. <laughs> Hello? Oh, it's Jeff from Channel 5. He's, what, he's one of my new showbiz friends. So we have to ease them out very gently. From that, there is then television interviews, radio interviews. We were a group of ten very disparate people brought together for a television Did you program. say desperate or different? Um, disparate. Oh, sorry, OK. <laughs> and each of them then has a sort of raft of offers that comes in that is very specific to them in terms of how the rest of the media is perceiving them. Last weekend I made a record, so... Um, What's that about? It's called The Game, and it's going to be out probably in about the next two or three weeks. Um, so I'm all excited about that. Ideal situation would be to go through and like practice all the different sort of uh, genres, like try being a presenter, try doing a radio show try writing something. Um, I've also been asked to go to Ibiza. So there's nothing worse than someone having a, a name and then doing something and being useless. I've just been with Thomas this morning, who, who, who came out on Friday. There is massive interest in Ireland. Thank you, everybody, for coming here. Thank you to the organisers. Thank you to the whole of Northern Ireland, this whole island, everybody here in the media. He just can't believe that people know his name on the street, that people know his face, um, that people want to come up to him and shake his hand. It's really strange because you see all these stars and then they're coming over and talking to you. It's, it's really freaky at times. Nothing could have prepared them for that, nothing at all. Oh, he's got lovely eyes. Did you need him right on it? Did you need him right on it? Quite nice chest as well and quite nice arms while we're at it. I can't believe that I was sitting there talking to Davina McCall. <laughs> that was really cool. <laughs> These people have gone in as ordinary people and walked out as celebrities. Unfortunately, Keith wasn't always on hand to escort his stars. It all started as it should have, with the stars of the small screen out in force to toast some of the industry's biggest names. But once inside, it was the story of the summer all over again. Well, well, well. <laughs> 
guys have become household names overnight. But the really hard thing, if they want to keep that when they're on the outside, is they're going to have to somehow um, cash in on it. There's so many offers um, available, but there's no point rushing in and uh, almost doing too much too soon. So, you know, at this stage, we're looking at uh, every possibility, every angle, and uh, my agent will obviously judge, and I would judge what's best for me uh, for the long term.